here's the gospel. So you notice this is a long, a, a big passage. We're not going to cover everything we need to cover in this passage today. We're going to revisit it next week and uh, fill in some of the gaps we won't get through uh, today. So some of you who know me are like, wow, that's a lot. We're going to be here all day. Well, we still might be here all day, but I'm kidding. We won't. I promise. So let's look. First of all, we're looking at the death. We're looking at the burial. We're looking at the resurrection of Jesus. Look at verse 44 to 45. It was now about the sixth hour. That is noon. That's midday. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. That's 3 p.m. in the middle of the day. Darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. All right? So as Jesus, he's here on the cross, right? He's on the cross at noon. And while he's on the cross for three hours, in the middle of the day, when the sun was at its peak, For three hours, the sun's light failed and it went dark. How far the darkness extended, we don't know. It says over the whole land, but it was a great anomaly for those who were there. So what was this darkness all about? Well, we know know one thing it wasn't. It was not a solar eclipse. The ESV Study Bible says this is not a solar eclipse since Passover. All this is happening at Passover. This is not a solar eclipse since Passover occurred during a full moon and a solar eclipse can only can occur only during a new moon. So we know this isn't some like scientific thing. This is a work of God. What we do know is this, is that in Scripture, darkness can signify judgment. Lamentation. You can look in Exodus and Joel and Amos and Revelation and just see references to how darkness signifies judgment. As a matter of fact, Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 8, Matthew 22, Matthew 25 describes hell, the place of eternal judgment for sinful unbelievers as what? Darkness, the outer darkness. So this midday darkness was likely signifying the judgment of God poured out on Jesus for his people's sins. Warren Wiersbe says, it was a God-sent darkness that shrouded the cross as the Son of God was made sin for us. End quote. You see, here's the deal. God is holy. Everybody say that with me. God is holy. God is holy. He's perfectly righteous. He is righteousness defined. If you want to know what is right, you look at God. He defines it. And this standard for all of us to live by is perfect righteousness. Perfect obedience to His Word. But guess what? You don't have to guess because you know. We all fall way short of that standard. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we all, all of us, you, me, was talking with a neighbor the other day uh, leaving church and I was riding my bike to church now since I lived back there and was riding home and ran across the neighbor, stopped and talked to him, got to share the gospel with him and was sharing with him that all of us, him and me, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have rebelled against God in hostility, selfishly and arrogantly living the way we want to live instead of the way he wants us to live. You might not feel you've sinned against God. Let me tell you why you don't feel like you've sinned against God. Because you've taken God's standard of perfection and you've lowered it to one that you can live by and feel good about yourself living under. And not under the the obvious uh, rebellion that we have against God. It's like a batting average, right? Baseball's starting up. Gamecocks are winning, kind of. And, you know, I don't know what the Tigers are doing. But, you know, baseball season has started. Opening day was the other day. What do we do with a batting average? What's a great batting average? 400, right? 350. But you know, that's only like 35% or 40%, right? A a perfect batting average is 1,000, right? Hitting the ball every time you get it back. But we think a good batting average is 40%. What have we done? We take what is perfect, considered perfect, and we dumb it down to what we really can do. And we consider it good. And that's what we have done with God. We take 
the way we live and say, you know, it's really not that bad, but the standard is perfection and we've all fallen short of that. We've all rebelled against God. Whether we are religious or irreligious, whether we are moral or immoral, whether we are a churchgoer or a non-churchgoer, all of us are by nature sinners, and as such, we express our desire to live our lives independent of His design for us. We've been corrupted by sin, and it controls our desires. It controls our attitudes. It controls our actions. It controls our lives. Scripture says that those living in the flesh, talking about sinners, we can't please God. So all of us are unholy rebels against an infinitely holy God. And that deserves great, great, great punishment. That's why darkness fell that day. God hates sin and He has to judge it and He was judging our sin in Christ. We deserve great punishment for our sin. A punishment that we all would receive eternally in hell if Christ had not taken it for us. So, On the cross, in the darkness of those midday hours, the infinite Son of God was enduring the infinite wrath of God for our sin against the infinitely holy God. Jesus absorbed it all. You see, today we're celebrating the resurrection. You don't have a resurrection, the reality of the resurrection, unless you have the reality of the cross. To get to the hope of the resurrection, you got to go through the cross and the reality of the cross. And the reality of the cross is that the reason it happened was because of your sin and mine. God was pouring His judgment for our heinous, horrible, wicked sin against God on Jesus. The pain that Jesus experienced on the cross is way, way, way more than physical. It was physical pain. The bloody cross was intended to be a picture of our ugly sin. Yes, it was. But it was the pain Jesus experienced was way more than that. He was being spiritually judged for our sin. Our sin was poured on the sinless Christ. 1 Peter 3.18 says this, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous that He might bring us to God. So for the righteous Son of God who hates sin to be treated as unrighteous as He bears the infinite consequences of our sin, the cup of God's wrath, it's a spiritual pain we can't even imagine. Hendrickson says this, The darkness meant judgment. The judgment of God upon our sins. This punishment was borne by Jesus so that He, as our substitute, suffered most intense agony. Hell came to Calvary that day, and the Savior bore its horrors in our stead. But the darkness wasn't the only sign from God that day. Look at verse 45 again. While the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in what? Two. This was the curtain that hung in front of the Holy of Holies. I don't have time to tell you all about this, but there was a part of the temple that was called the Holy of Holies. And there was one guy once a year that could go in there, the high priest on the Day of Atonement. This was the place where the presence of God was. And he would go in there to make atonement for mankind's sins. And only he, one time a year, could go in there. This curtain was, there was this curtain separated that Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. This this high priest that went in there, he was the mediator between God and His people. And this curtain was a reminder of the separation between sinful us and holy God. This curtain, I think, if I remember correctly, was was about the width of the palm of, of a hand. Huge temple, a huge curtain in the temple. But in Jesus' death, That curtain literally ripped in two. In Jesus' death, the way was opened for us to go 
to be in the very presence of God now and eternally. Listen to Hebrews 10, 19 to 20. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain that is through His flesh. The tearing of the curtain reminds us of the tearing of His flesh that won our salvation and allowed us into the presence of God. This is the Gospel. This is the Gospel. The Gospel is that we don't deserve to be in the presence of God and we are separated from God because of our sin and we'll receive eternal judgment from God if something isn't done about our sin and we are reconciled to God. The gospel, all of us are sinners. We deserve that judgment, but Jesus came and let his flesh be torn, bearing the weight of our sin and punishment. Bearing God's wrath for our sin so that it could all be paid for, we could be forgiven, we come to Christ in faith, repentance and faith, and he wipes our sin away and we are brought into the very presence of God now and forever. We are reconciled to God, brought back, made right together with God. It's like it's like if, if you're a criminal and you got your rap sheet, right? And all of our rap sheets full of sin, just full. Jesus' rap sheet, he ain't got one. He, he, he was perfectly righteous. He never did anything wrong, right? We, our rap sheet long, his rap sheet nothing. For us to be accepted before God, to enter God's presence, we have to have nothing on our rap sheet, but we have a lot of things on our rap sheet. Jesus comes to the cross, and he says, give me your rap sheet. And God crushes him for our crimes, for our sins, for our rebellion. And when we come to him in faith, he gives us his perfect record of righteousness, his A++++ all the way down. And so before God, we present to him not our righteousness, but the gift of righteousness Jesus has given us that we are clothed in, and God accepts us as righteous. My favorite verse in the Bible, God made him who knew no sin, that's Jesus, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's good news, isn't it? So when Jesus bore our sin took on our sin, took the wrath of God for our sin, right? He, uh, he ripped open the way that, that we were separated between us and God. He ripped it open so now forever we can be with God because our sins are dealt with and forgiven. Jesus said, John 14, 6, famous verse in the Bible. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Listen, no one comes to the Father except through me, through his ripped flesh through his sacrifice and the curtain by the way matthew tells us was ripped. this is so cool god's awesome the curtain was ripped from top to bottom almost as if god ripped it. verse 46 to 47 let's keep on moving then jesus calling out with a loud voice said father into your hands i commit my spirit and having said this he breathed his last now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, certainly this man was innocent. So just really quickly, knowing what crucifixion, it was a horrible form of death. Knowing what crucifixion did to a person, and to see that Jesus, having such strength and coherence right before his moment of death, he, he, he utters this loud cry, it leads many people to believe this, that Jesus decided when he was going to let go of his life. You see, crucifixion victims, right? A lot of times they would not even be coherent before they died with the loss of blood and all that the physical stuff that happens to your body. They, it, you would just shut down and then die, but not Jesus. He's coherent enough to say words and say them loudly and not just because he's dying. As if he just decided when he was going to die. Jesus' strength at his death seems to be part of what impressed this centurion. When we look at Mark's gospel, 
Mark's words were when the when a centurion saw you know how he died, then he called out, "Truly, this man was a son of God." Luke says that he says he was innocent. So this centurion is crying out, "This was the innocent son of God!" After he saw how Jesus died. J.C. Ryle says this: Christ died not as we die. When our hour has come, not because he was compelled and could not help dying, but voluntarily uh, and of his own free will, end quote. So, so Jesus gave himself over to death and he committed his spirit into the hands of his father. Jesus himself in John 10 says this, I lay down my life that I may take it up again. Listen to what Jesus said. No one takes it from me but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. So what does this tell us? Jesus Christ willingly laid down his life for you. He was in the garden. Peter wanted to fight these people coming to arrest him. Jesus stopped it. He said, I could call 12 legions of legions, angels and stop this right now, but I've got to go through this. He could have stopped it, but he didn't. He willingly went through it. You know what else? He, he's, he's there being accused by the, by the religious leaders, right, before Pilate and Herod, and Jesus isn't saying a word. Why? He's not mounting a defense. If he mounted a defense, it would be convincing enough to likely get him off the cross and not be crucified. But he came to be crucified, so he willingly let them accuse him and bring about his death. Even as he, even as he was mocked on the cross, he saved himself, you know, he saved others. Why don't he save himself? Come down off the cross if you're the son of God. He could have done that, but he willingly let himself hang there out of love for you and me because that was God's plan for our salvation. Jesus willingly laid down his life for you. Do you feel the depth of that reality? What are you going to do with that? Verse 48 and all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle when they saw what had taken place returned home beating their breasts. This beating of the breasts, this was a sign of grief, guilt. You can look at Luke 18. Some of you who are familiar with your scriptures know the, the Pharisee and the tax collector. Remember, the tax collector is beating his breast in repentance, right? Right? This, this being of the breast is a sign of grief, guilt, contrite mourning, fear, foreboding. They likely felt their guilt in all this, that they helped bring all this about. They had experienced up close that day in that darkness the releasing of God's judgment upon sin, and they were convicted, they were grieving, and they were disturbed. Could it be possibly that this was the foundation God laid for so many to get saved just about 50 days later at Pentecost. You remember? Maybe all those people, thousands of people started getting saved when Peter preached that sermon in Acts chapter 2. Could it be? And very likely a lot of the people that were at the cross were getting saved that day. Could it be that because of what they experienced when, when God poured his judgment on Jesus and them feeling conviction and grief and guilt that their hearts were being prepared to come to Christ on that day? That Peter preached. Wow. God's wrath against our sin, by the way, it should lead us to fear. It should lead us to mourning. It should lead us to conviction, guilt, and repentance. The wrath poured out on Jesus is going to be poured out on sinners. It is. Today's a happy day. But for those who reject Christ, today is not a happy day. If they realize the truth of their condition before God, because the wrath that, 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 that God poured out on Jesus is going to be poured out on sinners who reject him as their Savior. And that's eternal, and that's called hell. So if you're an unbeliever, why in the world are you living so comfortable as if not following Jesus is no big deal? Oh, it's a big deal. Do you realize, unbeliever who's rejecting Jesus, the cosmic tidal wave of God's wrath that will flood you for eternity in the fiery flames of an eternal hell? 2 Thessalonians 1, 8-9 says, In flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God 
and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. Jesus Himself calls hell eternal fire, eternal punishment. That's in Matthew 25. It's not fun to say, but that's a reality. And that punishment that sinners are going to receive who reject Him is going to be just. Because they've rejected the only hope for their forgiveness and salvation. And their sin deserves judgment. But, for those who turn from their sin in repentance and put faith in Jesus for salvation, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6.23 says that. They shall not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16. So, unbeliever, how can you turn that choice down? That's like saying, hmm, do I want to go to Chick-fil-A or do I want to go to McDonald's? Obviously, the answer is what? Duh. Jesus is chicken. That's right. Let's look at the burial of Jesus quickly. Verses uh, 50 to 56. Now, there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man who had not consented to their decision and action, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. We're going to get into Joseph next week. He's a, he's a dude, man, I'm telling you. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever yet been laid. It was the day of preparation and the Sabbath was beginning. Listen, the women who had come with him, that's Jesus, who had come with Jesus from Galilee, followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. That's important. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointment. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. There's so much here. We'll get to it next week. But just for our purposes today, Luke is very careful to show us that Jesus really was dead and buried. We know who buried him. We know how he got his body. We know how he and Nicodemus, by the way, We know how they prepared the body. We know when he was buried. We know where he was buried. And the witnesses that saw him buried. Jesus was dead. And Jesus was buried. These people knew that he was dead. And they treated his body as such. He really did die as our sacrifice. The penalty of our sins was truly paid. And the women who went to the tomb on Sunday morning saw the tomb that he was laid in. That's important. Look at the resurrection. 24 verses 1 through 3. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. They found one thing and didn't find another. They found a stone move, but they didn't find Jesus. So after observing the command to rest on the Sabbath, the women went early on Sunday morning with their spices to continue the burial process of Jesus or just to anoint his body in an act of love and devotion. They went there only to find that the stone, and by the way, this stone was a big stone. Matthew 27 tells us that this stone was great. See, rich people, Joseph was rich, we'll find out next week. He was rich, and rich people could have could afford a tomb, nice tomb, with a nice big huge stone that sealed that tomb. And this was his tomb. This stone, Matthew 27, verse 60 tells us, was great. Mark tells us in chapter 16, verse 4, that this stone was very large. This was a stone that had to be rolled away, rolled into place and rolled away, not lifted and put in like some may have been, but rolled. It was huge. They find the stone rolled away, but they didn't find Jesus' body. And the words of the angel communicate the truth that is the cornerstone of our faith today. The cornerstone of our hope today. Look at verses 4 through 8. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. Those were angels. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? 
He is not here, but has what? Risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. Folks, Jesus was risen. Jesus is still risen. Pastor Anya Bweedley says this, that Jesus was not clothed in grave clothes anymore, but now he was clothed in glory. Romans 6, 9, Paul. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Jesus' words himself in Revelation 1, 17 to 18, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the key, keys of death and Hades. Folks, death could not hold Jesus anymore. That song we just sang, death could not hold him, the grave could not keep him from rising again. Hell lost. Satan lost. Sin lost. Death lost. Jesus won. The crucified and risen Jesus is the center of this story. Not the centurion, not the women, but man, we got some awesome things to think about the women next week. God was so gracious to these women. But the center of the story is not the centurion. It's not the women. It's not Joseph of Arimathea. It's Jesus. It's him that we lead this passage, worshiping and adoring. Look at verses 9 through 12. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. It's important. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Look. One of my favorite things to talk about is this, and I'm going to fly through it, so listen quickly. Luke gives us so many reasons, so many reasons to know for certain that Jesus was really raised. One, all the gospel accounts tell us that the first witnesses to his, the empty tomb are women. Women. Now, we would not say this today, but back in that day, women were seen as a little bit inferior. Right? Their testimony in court was not reliable. Not nearly as reliable as men. So if you're manufacturing a resurrection story, you are not going to put in there that the first witnesses to bring this news back are women. But it's put in there because that's how it happened. They did not go to the wrong tomb. They saw where he was laid. They went to the right tomb. Some people say... They were hallucinating, all right? Okay. One, they were taking their spices. They weren't expecting a resurrection. So if they're going to hallucinate that the body of Jesus is not there, that means that they're going, wanting that to happen, expecting that to happen, hoping for that to happen, but they were not going with any of that. They were going to prepare a body, and when it wasn't there, they were perplexed. And if, the, if, they halluc- if there was a hallucination the likelihood of it being a group of women and not just one, it's just, it obviously cannot happen. Also, what? When the Roman, when the soldiers and, and the leaders find that the tomb is empty, what do they do? I think it's Matthew 26. They, or, no, it's 27. They, they come up with a story. It might be 28. It's one of those last chapters of Matthew. They come up with a story that the disciples came and stole the body. Well, what are they doing with that, by the way? They're not saying, no, uh he's still in there. They're affirming by saying this ridiculous story that the disciples stole the body. They're affirming that the tomb is empty. So we know the tomb is empty. But they come up with this absolutely absurd story that the disciples stole the body. Why can that possibly not be? Well, one, we've got this great stone in front of uh, this tomb that was guarded by soldiers, right? Okay, so that would, that would mean that these disciples would have to somehow get through these 
soldiers that was made as secure as they knew how, it would mean that they would break that Roman seal, which is a no-no. It would mean that they would somehow move that stone while getting soldiers away. And then it would mean that they would take this body out of the tomb. But if somebody's going to steal a body, are they going to unwrap it in the tomb and then just kind of carry it? No, they're going to grab that body and go. But the linen cloths were still there. Because they didn't go in the tomb. Jesus left the tomb. By the way, these apostles, they did not steal the body. John 20, verse 19 says that they were locked behind closed doors for fear of the Jews. They were scared to death. They're not going to go. It's ridiculous. And when the women come back to say that the body's gone, they don't believe them. Mm. But something convinced them. And we're going to get to some of it as we continue to study Luke. And there's... Jesus appeared, I don't. I, I think I saw somebody say there was at least 10 appearances of Christ after his resurrection that the scriptures record. Christ appeared to his disciples, and they realized he was risen. And these guys, who were fearful of the Jews, who fled when Jesus was arrested, they left him, who didn't believe these women, these guys, we find them in Acts, preaching the gospel of the resurrection of preaching that Christ is risen, and we see all of them, except for John, although they tried to martyr him, we see all of them killed for their faith. Something convinced them. What convinced them? The resurrection of Christ. Paul even tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that there was one time Jesus appeared to over 500 people at one time. And while he was writing that, some of them were still alive, he said. Look, it is clear just from the evidence we have here that Christ is risen. He's risen. Paul, who was Paul? Paul hated Christians. He persecuted Christians, but the risen Christ appeared to him, and then he became a Christian, going out and sharing the gospel of his death and resurrection. So the disciples may have thought that it was an idle tale when the women told them that Christ had risen, but not us. It's not an idle tale for us. We have every reason to believe it's the absolute truth. And again, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul tells us that our whole, listen to what Paul says. Paul says that our whole faith hangs on the resurrection. He takes the whole Christian faith and he hangs it on the resurrection. And he said, if that resurrection is not true, your faith is useless. So here's what I'm thinking. If you're creating a man-made religion based on a made-up event of a resurrection, why in the world would you hang it all on an untrue event that you knew to be untrue that if disproven would destroy and undercut your whole religion? Oh, the resurrection is true. They knew it, so can we. All right, let's keep moving. As the women left the tomb, Matthew tells us, So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. All right? So if we really think about the resurrection, the implications of the resurrection, we too, with so much more understanding of the truth than these women had at that moment, we're gonna, we would be filled with joy. We'd be filled with worship, too. So let me run through some resurrection implications as we close today. What did the resurrection do for us? One, the resurrection helps us see that Jesus truly is the Son of God. Romans 1.4 And was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. So, in a world where truth is seen as relative, there's a truth that is absolute. Jesus is the Son of God. And if you follow Him, you're following the one true God. That's comforting. I mean, people are telling you, live your truth, you know, as if, You can define your truth. You know, they're saying, live your truth, you be you, all that kind of stuff, as if truth is relative. 
Well, there's something that's true whether you believe it or not or whether it's you or not or whatever, and that is that Jesus is the Son of God. And if you follow Him, you're following the one true God. But if you reject Him, you are rejecting the one true God, and that is terrifying. What else does the resurrection mean for us? It means that God accepted the work of Christ on Calvary as sufficient payment for all our sin. Mm, This is so good. I've got to move quickly, though. Romans 4 24 through the first verse of chapter 5. Righteousness, it. Paul's talking about righteousness when he says it. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses, listen, and raised for our justification. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? That means that when Christ bore our sin, all of God's wrath was exhausted on him, and God was pleased with what Jesus did. And he accepted as full payment for your sin and mine what Jesus did. And to show that, to affirm that, to show that through his death, we are truly justified if we believe in him, truly made right, he raised him from the dead. Instead of him being condemned for sin anymore, he need not be. The debt was paid. He's raised and glorified and ascended. The resurrection, when when God raised Jesus, he was affirming that his wrath had been satisfied. Full payment for our sin had been made. All had been done to make us right with God now. There is nothing to be added to work for and secure our salvation. Repentance of our sin and faith in the work of Christ alone brings You look at your bank account, you know, you look at all your bills and you you look at your bank account and you're like, I ain't got enough. But you look at all your sin and you look at Jesus and you're like, he's enough. He's enough. I don't have to work to earn my way to God. What Christ did was enough to make me right with God. And he affirmed that when he rose Jesus from the dead. Now, when we come to faith in Christ, we work after that. We obey after that. It's a certain sign of 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 a truly saved person is obedience to Christ, but obedience to Christ doesn't save us. It's the fruit of our salvation and not the root of our salvation. What else does the resurrection show us? As Christ was raised, so we will be raised. Just a few verses here. 1 Corinthians 6, 14. God raised the Lord Jesus and will also raise us up by his power. Philippians 3, 20 to 21. But our citizenship is in heaven. He's talking about believers here, not unbelievers. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body. 1 Corinthians 15, 22-23, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at His coming those who belong to Christ. What is he saying? He's saying that as Christ was raised in a new and glorious body, So when you die, and then when Christ returns, you will be raised and united with him in a new glorious body. And in the meantime, your spirit is with him forever in heaven. Your spirit's with those that believers that have passed right now are in the presence of God. Their spirit is. But when he comes back, those believers who have died. Their bodies are going to raise and to be made new like his glorious body. We are promised a glorious resurrection because of the resurrection of Jesus. He is the first fruits. We come after. This is our hope. All right, Christian, I'm about to make you uncomfortable. Another implication of the resurrection. We can have new life. We can have victory over sin. Oh, but I'm a sinner. Oh, no. Listen, Romans 6, 4 to 6. We were buried, therefore, with him in bab- by baptism into death. Listen, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that, listen, we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Oh, believer, you got no excuse to 
to just give in to your sinful nature. When God calls you, and when Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey me, he means it. When, when, when John says, if you don't walk according to the commandments, you don't know Jesus. When Scripture uplifts the obedience of a Christian in their life, the obedience to the Word, it's serious. They, they, scripture means that. God means that. But the only way we can have any hope of obeying Him is because Christ, we have been raised to new life in Christ, and now we have the power through the power of Christ that lives in us to obey. We are not enslaved to sin anymore. So believer, go obey. You have the power to do so. The unbelieving world does not. But you do. All right, almost done. Raised and ascended, Jesus is our interceding advocate before God. I'll just mention this quickly. Right now, Jesus, he, he was raised from the dead. He's ascended before the Father. And right now before the Father, he is advocating for you and me, Christian. He's interceding for us. He, even when we do sin, and we will sin, right? But we continue to, to move in a direction of not sinning. But when we do fall, God stands there. Jesus stands there and said, I covered that sin Father, they're forgiven. They're yours. Jesus prays for us. He intercedes for us. Raised and ascended right now, we have an advocate before the Father. Praise the Lord. Jesus is a living Savior. Listen to what Legan Duncan says. The resurrection also reminds us that we love and serve and worship a living Savior. That means you can talk to Him. It means that He's interceding for you. It means that He comforts you. It means that He's a good shepherd who walks with you in the valley of the shadow of death. And lastly, implication of the resurrection. Christ will come to judge the world. Acts 17, 30-31. The times of ignorance God overlooked. But now... He commands all people everywhere to repent because He has fixed a day on which He will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom He has appointed and of this He has given assurance to all by raising Him from the dead. God said, I'm raising Him and He will win salvation. Come trust Him, repent and be saved. But because I raised Him, and he's ascended, he's coming back to judge sin. Risen and ascended, he will come again to judge the world. That is certain. So unbeliever, unbeliever, repent and trust in Christ for your salvation. So on that day, you are seen to be in the righteousness of Christ. Wow, wow, wow. The believer should have so much hope. The believer should have so much joy. So much worship of Christ because of the resurrection. He's alive. Amen? He's alive. There is none more worthy of your hope, none more worthy of your joy, none more worthy of your worship than the risen Christ. In fact, all of your hope, all of your joy, all of your worship, you're worshiping something, all of that is misplaced if they're not in Him. It's like you're pointed at the wrong target. But by His death and His resurrection, Jesus identified our greatest need, and that is salvation from our sins. And by his death and resurrection, he provided the only means to meet that need. So again, unbeliever, repent of your sin and trust him today as your Savior and Lord. Believer, oh believer, do what Hebrew, the writer of Hebrews said. Hold fast to your confession of him. Believer, you need to hear this in the world we live in today. Hold fast to your confession of Jesus. Your faith in him, your obedience to him. He is the crucified, buried, risen, victorious, and returning Lord in whom is our only life and our only salvation. Glory to his name. Amen? Amen. God is good. Listen, if you're an unbeliever, you want to talk about salvation, coming to Christ, we're here. We're here. Call us. Catch us before you leave. Whatever you want to do. We, would, uh, we will make time in our schedule to talk to you about that. We love you. Let's pray. God, thank you for this word. You are good. You are good. You're alive. You're risen. Mm, so much hope, so much joy.
God liked that early church who proclaimed a risen Savior in great confidence and boldness. May we go proclaim a risen Savior with confidence and boldness. A risen Savior who conquered sin, who conquered death, who comes to give forgiveness and mercy and life, who comes to offer hope in the middle of hopelessness, who came from the deep heart of love from a loving Heavenly Father that wants to save His people from their sin. Oh, God, thank You. Thank You. God, may we, may we just soak in that today. And then just go proclaim that to everyone who will hear. That they may soak in the joy and the forgiveness and the mercy and the hope of a crucified and risen Savior, you're worthy.